we are a purpose-driven profession, and we have to understand that sometimes the the uncomfortable conversations that we have are necessary because they lead to better compliance. Not long ago, I went to the doctor's office to get my annual blood draw. It was pretty early in the day, but I wasn't the first person called to the back. The nurse sat me down and didn't even look me in the eye. She poked, she drew, and pointed me back to the exit. The visit was efficient, but there was no human connection. Luckily, my primary doctor, whom I met for the first time a week earlier, had been extremely nice, looked me in the eye, listened to me, and was even patiently understanding when I explained I was very short on time. When it comes to healthcare for people or animals, it's more than an appointment. It's about building a good experience and a relationship. Our guest today is Debbie Boone, who is the hospitality expert. Debbie managed AHA accredited veterinary practices for 23 years and led teams to be strong and empowered advocates for their patients. Her hospital's astounding 87% preventative care compliance rate definitely got noticed. Debbie has more than 35 years of experience working with a vast network of industry professionals and is an author, speaker, and consultant. Today, we will learn the value of hospitality in practice and in the broader leadership and relationship settings and exactly how to achieve it. Here's our conversation with Debbie Boone. Well, I, I'm also very excited about your book. Now that it's on Amazon, I can, I can go on it and get a copy myself, but we'll definitely put links in to show people where to go. But I am really excited to also get more of your full story, you know, leading up to the book and, and all the ways you've gained your knowledge to get to this book. So I think that's really exciting. And we talked about this a little bit earlier this week. How, what was your start into your interest in getting into veterinary medicine? Yeah, well, I grew up kind of a farm kid. Uh, my mother and father were both farm kids. And so for the summers, I would spend some summers out at my grandparents' farm where they had a menagerie. And of course, they were raising hogs. They were uh, raising chickens and gathering eggs. And they had a mule, which I thought was wonderful, um, and dairy cows. So I kind of grew up around animals and just really loved it. I loved going out there. In fact, I would cry to not come home because I wanted to stay out there on the farm. So I always thought from a really young age that I wanted to be a veterinarian. And that's not an unusual story. Most of uh, the veterinarians I you know, talked to want to be, from the time they're like five to 15, they decided they want to be a vet. But um, I pursued a degree in animal science from NC State. Uh, in the meantime, I was working in my family's restaurants. They had five full service restaurants. The largest one uh, in Virginia would seat about a thousand people, but most of them seated about 250 to 300. And um, I grew up in the public. Uh, so serving people, learning how to take care of the, the public. And I always laugh and say that hangry thing is real because hungry people are, are spicy, just like uh, anxious people in the veterinary hospital. And so you just learn how to manage them well. So I learned to offer hospitality at a young age because my parents were adamant about that. We laugh and talk about, um, I was visiting my mother yesterday and she's she'll turn 90 in September, but people still come up to her on the street and talk about their experiences in the restaurants. And she said, I don't even know how these children remembered me because they were little bitty kids when they were sitting in those high chairs at the restaurant. But it was it was like a family dinner every Sunday. And so people had this routine. They came out of church. They came to Huey's. They ate chicken pie, and ate lemon meringue pie, and sweet tea. And then they went home and took big naps because they were so full. So I, that was, you know, how what I learned growing up. But I still never wanted to be in the restaurant business. So I started to uh, go to NC State. I had a degree in animal science, pre-vet. The original goal was they would build a vet school by the time I finished undergrad, but there was some politics involved in it and the school was delayed about two years. So I was out. Um, and I then I just thought I just didn't want to go back. But I moved to Greensboro, North Carolina. And to get my foot in the door, I started at a veterinary hospital as a part-time receptionist. And the hospital owner had 
uh, three hospitals at that time. And I would work in the mornings in one small hospital. And then I would come to what I call the mothership hospital and work in the afternoons. And I did that for about six months at minimum wage and determined I was going to starve to death if I didn't go and find a better job. So I left and I managed a retail fabric shop. Then I left there and I managed a jewelry department of a big box retailer for a little bit. And then one day I sold one of the associate veterinarians a watch. He was looking for something tough enough to manage the treatment room. This was before I watches and things like that. So I sold him this um, kind of rubberized Casio watch. And I said, well, tell Dr. Kopp I said hello. So he went back and he told the owner hello for me. And he, the next thing I knew, I was getting a phone call from Dr. Kopp. He said, you need to come over and talk to me. My wife tells me I need a manager. And she's tired of me coming home every night at 10 and 11 o'clock after running this business. So come over here and talk to me. And that's how I got my job. I just went over and he knew my background and it gave me this job as the, it was kind of a glorified bookkeeper at the, that point in time. But then over the years, I was there 19 years and eventually I was hiring all the staff and managing the entire hospital and marketing, doing everything that a manager does. And um, so yeah, I, I love that practice. I still love that practice. I still stay in touch with a lot of the people that work there. And I um, was in Greensboro, North Carolina. So Novartis Animal Health, their headquarters was right there. And we had a lot of Novartis people as clients. And so one day, one of them asked me to come and do a keynote or I mean a, a key opinion leader little group thing and I said okay and um, they found out we had something like an 87 percent compliance rate on preventative care and they wanted to know how we did it and I said well I, I can I think I can teach that and that's how it all started and I, I've been teaching it ever since so I went to work then for Reesville Veterinary Hospital which is a really large 11 doctor practice and um, during the recession I got laid off and so this when I started my consulting business and it's been going pretty strong ever since. Well, I'm sure so much of what you've learned is put into your book, but do you mind sharing a little bit of, of that, the secret <laughs> of sure. getting such high compliance? Well, I think the most important part is that everybody on your team knows why they're there. And I talk about this in the book is the very first chapter is know your purpose. We we are a purpose-driven profession, and we have to understand that sometimes the, the uncomfortable conversations that we have are necessary because they lead to better compliance, and it's about education. So our practice was very much hospitality-focused. We built relationships with our clients. We knew them. We knew their kids' names. We knew every dog they ever had you know, through generations, and because of that, we built high trust. Well, the other part of that is getting everybody in the building on the same page, because if in this, you know, if you've worked in practices and one or two doctors, it's easy because there's only one or two opinions. But when you have five to 11, <laughs> the opinions can really get broad. Like, when do we give kitten vaccines? Well, I think you should do it at six weeks. No, I think I wait to eight. No, I don't do this component of it. But that's really confusing. So uh, I, luckily, my practice owner was also a good business person. So I always say thank you to him for kind of teaching me how to do this and do it successfully. But we had standards. We were AHA accredited hospital for 25 years, but we followed very specific guidelines. And all the doctors were on the same page for routine things. I am a firm believer that medicine is an art, but I also believe that when you have a business, it has to have consistency because if one doctor says one thing to the client and they come in and they visit another one who says something different, well, the clients are not medically trained. So what that creates is confusion and lack of trust. So who is telling me the truth and who is trying to gouge me for price is typically the options that play through. So when we're all on the same page and they get a consistent message from the kennel assistant and the CSRs and the assistants and the technicians and the doctors, then that education is is really thorough uh, because everybody's always teaching the same message. And when you educate clients who really do want to do good care for their pets, people want to keep their pets healthy, but we don't spend the time that it takes a lot of times to, to educate. And I know you're 
you know, a nutritionist. And I, one of the things we talked about a lot was food and the importance of feeding the correct thing. And But it's training, training, training and being consistent across the board. And then really talking to people and listening to them more than you talk. We often feel like we are kind of the authority that dictates, here's what you're supposed to do. This is the playbook. But the playbook doesn't always work for for everybody. So we have to make sure that we're talking to those clients and finding out about their home lives and finding out about their schedule. And, you know, I think about just my mom, who I mentioned is close to 90, but she has severe arthritis in her hands and a diabetic cat. So when we found out Charlie was diabetic, the first concern for me was, can she manage to give the injections with her hands the way they are? Now, fortunately, this cat is just super chill. He's got part Maine Coon in him, and he's just an incredible cat. So she says, okay, Charlie, jump on the table. He jumps on the kitchen table. She gives him his injection, and he jumps back down. I mean, this is they have a fine oiled system there. But for a lot of people, if you don't pay attention to that kind of stuff, they can't comply. So it's about figuring out how to make it work for people. And I think that's the story behind the book is using the hospitality skills to discover enough about the humans who come into your building so that you can support them and that they can do what they want to do for their pets. Because if they didn't want to do good things for their pets, they wouldn't walk in your door. Absolutely. So with you being in the industry for a little while now, and you talked about the importance of a, a hospital finding your why that you can all get behind. What have you discovered is your personal why that keeps you in veterinary medicine and so excited about it? Well, the baseline is always care for animals, making sure those animals get the best care. But I discovered from my personal journey that if I can teach the humans how to better communicate with the humans, then the animals benefit. And so my personal why is really helping teams communicate better within their hospital so that they can have a great culture, that they don't have problems with bullying and toxicity and understanding each other's personality styles and making sure that they can work as a cohesive team. Because once the team gels together, miraculous things can happen in a hospital. And the team stays, which is another thing because you figure your clients love the consistency of seeing that same face over and over again and somebody that knows them. And the and the more you get to in, have encounters with a client, the greater the trust builds. And so that new client who comes in who doesn't know anybody is a little more difficult to get to say yes for the care but the one who's been seeing you for 10 years and every time they come in, you go, how's your kid doing in college? And how was that book you were reading last time? Those are the people who are going to say, yeah, I, I want to do what you tell me to do because I trust you. Yeah. Going back to that, building the relationship is a really unique part of, of veterinary medicine. I feel mm-hmm. like we do have the clients that they will continue to get pets and they keep coming back. And so yeah. we will start to know when their kids go to college and things like that. Mm-hmm. So it came up that some people may think that as we're advancing in in medicine and that people would want to constantly go to a new doctor for a new specialty or a new reason. But what they found is actually people really like having that relationship with their healthcare provider and they like coming back to that person. So, you know, the importance of maintaining these relationships with the humans Yes, we love the animals, but to yes. help the animals, we have to have the relationship yes. with the humans. Absolutely. Well, over the years, I've hired truly hundreds of people and interviewed probably more than a thousand. But but it always tickled me when people go, well, I came into vet medicine because I don't like people. And I'm like, you know what? You're not going to make it here because this <laughs> is a people business. It is a people business and our product is medicine. And we need to look at it that way because we do have to build, and unlike human medicine, for veterinary medicine, because so few animals have pet insurance, we've really got to work to show the value for what we do, because we 
Our living is made on people's disposable income, whether we think it is or not. They could choose to buy school clothes. They could choose to buy a new car. They could choose to you know, go to Target and have a rampage shopping spree. But those are disposable dollars that we are vying for. And we often think, oh, the veterinary hospital down the road is my competition. And that's not true. Everything that could possibly take somebody's income other than their mortgage payment and food is our kind of uh, competitor in the marketplace. So we really have to make it worthwhile for people to spend the money because it's not fun to spend money at a veterinary hospital, right? It's you come in and your dog gets vaccines and it walks out and it looks exactly like it did when it walked in and you spent a couple of hundred bucks and you're like, man, you know, this really doesn't seem valuable. So we have to really talk about the consequences of not and spending time listening to people. I think that's one of the most important things. I just finished listening to this amazing book. It, I'm still working through it the last couple of chapters, but it's called What the Patient Says and What the Doctor Hears. Mm. I really believe this should be mandatory reading for every doctor and every veterinarian because we interrupt people and they want to tell us their story. We, they want to tell us the things that are bothering them about what's going on with their pet. But, you know, as a doctor, you start developing your diagnosis within about 10 seconds of them starting the conversation. And it surprised me. One of the stats that came out of this was truly the the lack of value of in human medicine of the true physical exam for a healthy patient because most of the diagnostic diagnostics is, uh, comes from what the patient tells you. So it's more valuable for us in vet med because our patient can't tell us stuff, but the observations of the owner are what we need to hear. But we will stop them in the middle of their kind of story and start to ask diagnostic questions instead of letting them get it all out. And then there's always, when you're finished, it's the, oh, by the way, doc, he did this. And you're like, oh, why didn't you tell me that five minutes into, you know, five minutes into this visit? But it's because you didn't let them, right? If you had just said, and what else? And what else? And what else? Until they wound themselves down. But we're always pressured for time. And I try and have tried to teach for a long time that uh, sometimes slow is fast. And if you do take the time up front, that it saves you so much time on the back end because of the things that you didn't know and the exploration that you made that was unnecessary. But if you just had waited and listened a little bit longer and a little bit more intently to people, it would uh, solve a lot of problems for us. It'd speed us up a lot. It's the same thing with training. You know, s slow, it seems like you don't have time to train. But to me, if you don't have time to train, that means you don't have time to vaccinate. You don't have time to do exams. And you don't have time to do surgery. It's something you make a time for. My brain went down that exact same track. I was, I was thinking about how, you know, I've interviewed people like Jill Clark, who talks about, you know, some of the pushback with training staff. Mm -hmm. is, well, you we don't have time for that. It's like, well, if you just took the time to train up front or you listen up front, you may find the solution a lot faster yes. than if you're skipping that step. Yes. So absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And I think the listening comes into play, not just in a patient doctor relationship. I think it's a little bit of a human problem that oh, yes. <laughs> we constantly need to work on. Whether, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. In the, in the book, what I talk about is, um, of course, active listening and open-ended questions, which every doctor is taught, but often the support staff are not taught those things. And especially with your CSRs, and, and Jill and I know each other, we've talked a lot about CSR training. So you've got to train the CSRs to, to ask the good questions and to listen intently too, because they are often the they're triaging whether they have the skills or not. <laughs> Hopefully you're training the triage skills, but they are doing that and they need to be able to, to focus while phones are ringing, dogs are barking, people are talking, questions are being asked, doors are slamming, printers are printing. And how do you focus on the person on the phone? And that is through active listening. So I always taught when I was teaching the Patterson classes, think about playing the game Simon Says. And your intent listening level when you were playing Simon Says, so you did not 
mess up and pat your head when you weren't supposed to. And that is the level of listening that you need to do when you are speaking with any person, because everybody deserves your intent, intense attention when they are speaking. And then you deserve the same thing. You know, we've all been subject to the people who we know are not really listening to what we're saying. They're just waiting to talk. And it's incredibly rude for one thing. And that's, you know, we talk, I talk about it in the book and I don't know, maybe being raised in the South, it was something that you were taught to, just to listen more than you talked and to be polite and wave at your neighbors going down the road. Uh, you might've noticed that now that you're in Savannah, <laughs> but it's, it is, um, it's a way of life. It's a way of being, but it's, it makes life better for everybody when we treat each other respectfully. Yes. I grew up in Alabama, so I'm oh, a good Southern girl. I'm there like, <laughs> you go. You know. Yes. 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 We're starting to talk more about, you know, the challenges in practice to kind of get to that dream that, you know, people recognize that you were able to achieve and that you you write about. And, and so you mentioned quite a few wonderful things about facing challenges because we're going to have challenges. We we need to have challenges in order to grow. So I'd love to hear more about your thoughts when it comes to a natural approach to challenge, failure, and growth. Sure. I think there's an unrealistic expectation that you're supposed to be happy all the time. First of all, that's not how life goes. Uh, I've been interviewing people on my podcast, The Bend, and I have about 65 to 66 interviews of people and talking about just the bends and opportunities that come to you out of unexpected places and how you face those things. And a very consistent message is to look at any kind of failure or challenge as a potential growth opportunity, because usually it works out that way. I know in the moment you're like, oh, you know, and I'm a, I'm a cancer survivor. So if you think about what good can you think comes out of being a cancer patient, the truth of the matter is a lot did. And a lot of the base of this book has to do with my experiences as a patient and what it feels like to be the subject rather than to be the medical provider, because I, you know, I've lived in both sides for a very long time, as you said, but the things I learned about empathy and doing good medicine and explaining things to, to the clients well, many of those stories come out of my cancer patient visits and the exemplary care I got at Duke Hospital. Some of the other stories that come out of, of, are <laughs> of some horrible experiences I had with other practitioners who were doing it completely wrong. And the way that I felt as a patient, and we can we can take that and translate that into our lives. So learning those kind of things, and then you know during the Great Recession, I got laid off from a very lucrative job as a practice chief operating officer, and you kind of think, oh, well now what do I do? Here we are in the middle of a recession. My husband and I had just bought a second home. It was like ah, but looking back on that, if I had not had that happen, uh, I would not have started a consulting practice. I would not, you know, own my own business and have the freedom that I have. And truly, I think have made, you know, some semblance of influence on the profession, teaching what I knew from growing up in the hospitality business. So it all worked out. It all works out like it's supposed to work out. And if we kind of go into it, that, that mindset that this is something that is supposed to happen to lead me to something better. And I'm going to learn some stuff from it that's going to help me with a future challenge. That's the other thing too. You know, so during the pandemic, the, the thing that I noticed that younger people particularly really were like chicken little. They thought the sky was falling and at every moment they were going to die. And the older people were like, eh, you know what? We've been through some stuff before. We'll get through this. And so they just trooped on. I look at, again, I look at my mom who went wherever she wanted to go. She wore her mask, she washed her hands, but she went wherever she wanted to go at 85, 86, 87 years old during the pandemic. And you had 20 year olds who wouldn't leave the house. They were you know, perfectly healthy and able to go. They were just uh, locked into fear. So hopefully we learn some stuff about our brain. And, and for the years of 
I think I got my first brain science book at an AHA conference in 2014 or something like that. But I started studying brain science and how our brain affects our decision making and how it affects our lives. And and really, truly at AHA, I mean, at AVMA, I'm, I'm giving a lecture called Your Brain is a Liar and Why That Matters. Because we do lie to ourselves and our brain is designed to only keep us safe from perceived harm, but not to really let us grow or face challenges or push the envelope. So if your limbic brain was allowed to do everything and take over your life, you would never leave the house. It would just keep you safe and hopefully fed, but that's about it. But the smart part of our brain, our cerebellum, is what we need to use in these tough times to say, I'm, yeah, it's, it's a fearful time. Certainly, I will say getting a breast cancer diagnosis is a fearful time, but I was fortunate that I had a lot of medical knowledge and I was really fortunate of where I was treated and I felt like. I could handle it, you know, and so the smart part of my brain took over and and I just logically moved through the process instead of having meltdowns because that never helps. It, it you know, to lose your crap never helps. <laughs> yes, that is a, a very wise <laughs> thing to just keep in mind. Uh, and I, I think the way I, I often tell people is, you know, panicking never helps no. in any situation. And even, you know, I, I sat for my board exam, oh goodness, it's, has it already been a month or something? And and people Uh were just so shocked by how calm I was by the fact that I had to wait 60 days and I'm still waiting for my results. And I said, well, there's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can change at this point. Why worry or get upset about it? (laughs) Exactly. That's, that ship has sailed. It's done. It really is done. Yeah. You're, but you're right. I mean, I think, and some people just do have a personality that's like, ah, about everything. And I've always been a very calm person. And I think that, you know, I'm just a logical thinker. And my husband always tells this story on me. I, I have a tendency to get strangled very easily. It's a thing I inherited from my family, but just on a sip of water or swallowing wrong and I'll get choked. Well, I was swimming in the deep end of a pool and some water splashed into my throat and I started to choke. And instead of panicking, I just kind of held my breath to stop from coughing and paddled myself to the side and stood there then gasping and choking. And my husband's like, God, are you okay?" But if I had panicked, I would have probably drowned or I could have certainly had much worse consequences. But keeping your mind calm is a really important skill set. And I talk about it in the book when we talk about emotional intelligence, because we have a tendency to, when people start to ramp up their behavior, we tend to escalate our own. Our emotions kick in and there is such a talent in being able to control yourself and talk to yourself in those points of time because that person in front of you, they're in limbic brain hormonal override (laughs) and you, you can do nothing to calm them down. You just have to let it run. And we need to realize that because they can always say something that will hit home. And I think the the one response that universally every veterinarian just really gets to us is you don't care about anything but the money. Because mm-hmm. we know so much more that you know, comparatively, we don't make that much money and uh, and the debt and the whole the whole story behind it. But, you know, clients are just grasping at straws. And that's truly what's coming out of their mouth at that point in time. I was teaching a class last week in Wilmington and I asked uh, my students, I said, have you ever had people who just like blew you out of the water at the front desk? And then they go and the manager talks to them and they're perfectly fine. And they went, yes, yes. I went, well, that's because. They were in limbic brain hijack when they talked to you. And by the time the manager got to them, they calmed down and their smart brain had taken over. But that's just the way your brain works. And, and some people have less control over it than other people do. But we we aspire to have emotional intelligence. <laughs> and and you're right, because, you know, back to the, the panicking doesn't help is that panicking is going to keep you in the 
in the survival part of your brain, yes. which I think you talk about the survival part of your brain just wants to keep you safe. It, it's, you know, it's not thinking about long-term yeah. or, you know, the, yeah. like you said, the smart part of your, uh, of your brain. So yeah, the ability to to calm down, but, but also to recognize when other people are in that part of yes. their brain, because I, I think, even though I, I like to think I'm a relatively calm person, you're going to have things that are impacting you that start to what I, I consider lower your threshold of yes. your ability to, <laughs> to kind of control that. Yes. So and veterinary medicine is a perfect example. You're tired, you're hangry, hangry you're, you know, you've, you're worried about other things, you're thinking about your kids, and it starts to lower your threshold. You mentioned emotional intelligence. And do you mind talking a little bit more about that? Because I, I don't know if we talk enough about it when it comes right. to our what we do every day. Yeah, going back to being the patient and understanding what it feels like to be on the other side of the table. We go through life every day thinking, talking about, working with people who are expert in veterinary medicine. Our clients see us once a year and they might read a little bit about what needs to happen with their pet, some funky online resource, who knows what they, where they're getting it from, but they don't live in our world. And it's really unfair for us to use our yardstick to measure them. So I feel like empathy is very important. And when we become jaded, uh, I know, I don't know if you remember seeing this meme or not. It was actually, I think, on a vet girl post. And it got a lot of pushback, which I was glad to see. But it was somebody whispering in the dog's ear, say, I'm sorry, your parents or, or your owners are idiots. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, no, that's not right. Everybody is ignorant of something. I can't lay bricks, you know. Uh, I, I don't know how to mix concrete. Uh, but there are clients that I have who know how to do that and do it expertly. So if you look at life that way, and, and I, I have a chapter in the book called uh, Who's the Hero of the Story? Hint, hint, it's not you. <laughs> <laughs> the client's the hero of our story. And our job is to be the wise counselor. We are the Obi-Wan Kenobi to the Luke Skywalker and, the, and our client. And the patient dilemma is the story. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, we're to guide them through that patient dilemma. So when we start to look at things a little bit differently, I think that our empathy can change because we realize that we have somebody who doesn't live in our world, who doesn't speak our language. And if we've ever talked to an IT professional, you understand how uncomfortable this conversation could be because you're speaking a language that only specific people understand. And then making it possible for people to, to understand complex con concepts. And that's sometimes challenging, but I laugh and say you can use the terms, but you need to explain it in a way that the person who is not medical can get it. I, I watched a veterinarian, been, he'd been practicing a long time, ask a lady one time, um, he explained to her that her cat was blocked. And he said, do you have an understanding of, of what that means? And she said, not really. And he said, well, have you ever had a clogged toilet? And she said, yes. He said, it's the same principle. And I went, that's brilliant. <laughs> she understood immediately what it was like to have a clog somewhere in the in the toilet. He did not talk about urethras or struvite stones or any of those things. He just said, here you go. And she got it. And she understood what the problem was. So it's... Um, we need to be a little more creative in a scientific community, I think, in, in order to get our clients educated in an empathetic way. And to also understand that, you know, they don't know what we know. And it's not fair to judge people like that. I wrote a blog one time and I said, uh, everybody I know drives a car and they will put gas in it and they will wash it occasionally. Uh, they know to get the oil and the tires rotated. But if it broke, they don't know how to fix the transmission. So it's the same principle just because you have a dog and you feed it and you wash it and you go and get it vaccinated. You don't know what to do if it goes beyond that, because that's when you need the expert. And so does your mechanic judge you? Well, maybe he does if you don't change the oil in your car, but once a year. <laughs> yeah, maybe he judges you a little bit. But that just means that you didn't know you were supposed to change the oil, but, you know, 
every 3,000 miles or so, depending on what your car is. So we we should not judge people because there's things that we don't know uh, out there in the world and that we are terribly ignorant about. And everybody everybody needs to have somebody who is willing to teach. And, and I really have always taught my team members, you are primary teachers of this subject matter. And if you need to teach it, so that people understand it and teach it consistently. Make sure the message is always the same through every person in your building so that the clients don't get confused. Confusion is a big, a big negative in our world. Oh, yes. And, you know, I think I, I learned more and more how to be empathetic as I have had different roles in my career as well. And my guess is that you've probably seen that as well too. Yeah. Everything from going to retail to managing practices to now being a consultant, mm-hmm. you're able to see things from different angles. And so do you mind before we have to to leave today, mm-hmm. explaining a little bit more about what you do now, your, mm-hmm. your, your consulting practice, sure. what that entails? Okay. I really focus a lot on communication and, and culture building in my consulting work, especially as a speaker and the book you know, particularly is focused on that because the hospitality part of it comes into the practice too. When we use hospitality skills for each other, we support each other rather than tearing each other down or trying to do the one-upmanship or hoarding knowledge. We are generous and respectful of each other. So I feel like that is a huge part of what I try to teach practice teams because once you get the people right, the rest of the stuff is easy. The rest of the stuff you can read a book and know, right? But a lot of it is helping people get themselves organized because practice owners typically have not had business classes. They don't know the rules of business and they're the rules are simple, but the rules are the rules. And you got to make sure that you are watching your numbers, making sure that you are actually making money off of the services that you provide, that you are supporting your team appropriately. So I I look at a lot of aspects. I laugh. I have a 17 page checklist and I start at the parking lot and I work through the entire building and I watch and observe the team and their interactions with clients and with each other. And I watch workflows and then I review the financial situations and the pricing structures and you know, it's it's everything from first impressions to do you have an accountant that knows what they're doing? Because sometimes the answer is no, because veterinary accounting is specific. And if we don't have an accountant that understands what we're looking for as far as benchmarking our normals, then to them, it's all tax preparation. And that's a different animal completely. No pun intended, <laughs> but it is it is uh, different of what we're looking for, what consultants look for, what practice management people look for is different than what a, an accountant looks for or a regular accountant, one who's not veterinary specific. So I, I do a lot of that kind of stuff. I actually help uh, because I am a writer. I help clients write a compelling ads because as you know veterinarians are very hard to find and so are support staff so you've got to write a compelling ad that tells your story and makes people want to come and work for you now you got to have something to write about so that's the important thing too you've got to have a culture that's worth bragging about or it's it's you know it's a lie you can't write a lie in an ad and expect people to to want to come and work for you or stay very long that's the other thing. So that's that's kind of basically the gist of what I do. I do some speaking at conferences. Uh, obviously, I write. I write articles. My favorite thing is to do like workshops with teams because I love teaching them some skills that they can use after I walk out the door. My goal for all my clients is that you don't need me anymore, that I teach you the skills and the theory, and then you don't need me anymore. And But I'm always here if you do. <laughs> I love that. And then also you, you do have your book brand new as we record this right off the press so people can go and get that. So we'll make sure to put links so that they can do that. Thank you. And I want to open it up. And is there anything that you would like to have as a a piece of advice or, or wisdom for the veterinary profession as, as we think about it today? Yes. As you go through your day, always assume positive intent with everybody, with your clients, 
with your fellow team members, with your family, because when we assume that people are doing the very best they can, then we look at things differently. Just leave that judgment to the people who do it officially. (laughs) This is not our place. We're here to help. You know, the other thing is no is not a bad thing if said appropriately and with grace. You know, you're a Southern girl. You you learned from a young age to how to say no and bless your heart. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> with then make people still feel good about it. And I think that's it. So sometimes it's that harsh no or that boundary that's too inflexible because it's you've got to be flexible in life. Otherwise, if you set this harsh boundary, you're going to frustrate a lot of people around you. It will always be a struggle because, you know, when you need some flexibility from them, they're going to go, no, remember that boundary you set with me? Guess what? There it is. So I, I feel like it's just about collaboration and working together, showing respect for people and listening more than you talk. I think that was Perfect. So I I always like to get to know the guests a little bit better with my final four questions. So the first one is, is there anything that people may get wrong about you? They may think that I am an extrovert, but the truth of the matter is I love holding up in my office and reading books and writing stuff. And I'm fine by myself. I do love, I do love speaking. I do love people. I find them fascinating, but I am perfectly fine alone. Yep. I can relate that to that as well. <laughs> Probably a lot of veterinary professionals. Can. I think so. The, yeah. the second question is, do you have a, a hidden skill or interest that maybe not a lot of people know about? Well, the funny thing is I can sing. My name is Debbie Boone. And if people ask me all the time if I can sing, and the answer is, yeah, sometimes <laughs> I do. So I have actually sung with the Barking Cats at some AVA, AVMA stuff. I'm, I may be doing it again this year. I don't know. Deb Stone hadn't told me yet. I don't do it much, but I do it for fun. And I am told I can carry a team. Oh, nice. <laughs> yes. When I Google Debbie Boone, I get several different people. Come you, up, do. So. <laughs> you do. You <laughs> do. Yeah. Yes. The third question is, is there anything that's on your bucket list that you would like to do? Well, during the pandemic, I was on this Facebook page called A View From My Window. And I kept seeing these beautiful vistas. And the most beautiful ones seem to be from Italy. So a bucket list is to visit Italy. And the other thing I want to do is go on a photographic African safari. Because Mm -hmm. I'm so concerned that if I don't go soon enough, we won't have anything to take pictures of. Both places are are wonderful and worthwhile visiting. So Ah. absolutely. (laughs) And finally, what is something you are most grateful for? I think I'm most grateful for having really good parents Mm -hmm. who taught me a work ethic when I was young, who taught me people skills uh, when I was very young and the value of education, because all those things have certainly benefited me in my career and in life in general. I'm an avid book reader. You can probably see behind me. That's just a small portion of what's in my house. But I feel like we can learn so much from books and avoid a lot of mistakes because people will tell you the mistakes that they made. And then you can go, oh, I don't have to do that because I learned about what to avoid because somebody else shared it with me. So, yeah book reading. Is that a big part of maybe putting one out there in the world yourself? Yeah, maybe so. I, this book came about, I had it in my head for years because I felt like it was something that veterinary medicine really, really needed to know. And I had been teaching it, but you know, there's only so many hours in the day and so many people you can get in front of. And so I decided I I could put it into a book. And I was having a cup of coffee with a friend at AVMA last year, Brenda Andreessen. And Brenda uh, is the uh, co-CEO of an advertising agent that works with Care Credit. So she called me up about two or three weeks after AVMA and said, you know that book you want to write? I said, yeah. She said, Care Credit would like to support you in writing that book. Do you think you can get it done before AVMA? And I went, that's, I got to get this done in like three months in order to get it out. You know, 
So I wrote the book in three months <laughs> on top of all the other stuff I was doing and writing. But I, it, it came so easily to me because I just knew what I wanted to say and the stories that I wanted to tell. And then there was a lot of you know editing and the publisher and the back and forth and back and forth. So we just <laughs> squeaked under the deadline. As you can see, it's in print July the 3rd and, and AVMA's next week. So it was quite an experience for me to write this book. And now I'm thinking, wow, I think I could write another one. And maybe the other one would be for maybe not healthcare, but maybe retail, because I feel like we're losing our hospitality skills. I feel like we're losing our people skills. And, you know, when I grew up learning how to manage conversations with adults, I mean, I was 12 years old when I started working in the restaurant and I was speaking to adults and seating them and taking their money and waiting on them as a server. And that's a skill set that we are losing. I, I gave a talk a couple of years ago for a AHA called How to Talk to a Stranger. How do you just walk up to a stranger and start to have a good conversation with them? And I laughed because the entry line was, uh, I'm the person who talks to people on airplanes. And everybody in the room went, uh. <laughs> and I said, but let me tell you, the opportunities that I've had to have really amazing stories told to me about people. For example, I met the man who led the soldiers into battle in Desert Storm. He was flying to Washington, D.C. on one of my flights. And I got the opportunity to say, as a leader, how do you lead people into battle when they know they can die? What leadership does that entail? Because we're just working on trying to get people to, you know, like do fecals <laughs> in their hospital. <laughs> and these people can go and die. And he said, it is trust and training. And I went, mm, trust your leadership to know what they're doing and train them until it is unquestioning what they need to do. And I went, wow, that, that's a lesson. That's exactly what we need to do in our teams. When people trust their leadership implicitly and they are trained to the end degree so they can do their work, you can conquer the world with that. This has been the Vet Life Reimagined podcast. Whether you are listening or watching on YouTube, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Please make sure you are subscribed to catch all these amazing people in our profession. Also, send this episode to someone you think who would appreciate it. Have a recommendation for someone who would be a good guest? Please reach out on LinkedIn, Instagram, or Facebook. There aren't that many Dr. Sprinkles. Until next time, Vet Lifers.